Mini episode 1127 of the FDH Lounge is brought to you by Sportsology, delivering unconventional columns and webcasts about sports, TV, music, movies, and more. Follow them on the web at sportsology.com. The FDH Lounge. You want to schedule your life around it. A long time ago, on a gloomy, wet Cleveland spring night, two men stand alone amidst the late night drizzle. Their voices echo across the vacant station parking lot as they debate the merits of the great American radio show that have been missing for far too long. On that night, an idea was born. That idea became the FDH Lounge. Welcome to the FDH Lounge. Welcome to mini-episode 1127 of the FDH Lounge. This is FDH Managing Partner Rick Morris here with our spoiler-free review of the 2007 one-season HBO cult classic, John from Cincinnati. Here's our top five things to know about this program. Number five, it's one of the most cursed and or overlooked shows in modern TV history. With the pilot airing immediately after the infamous Sopranos finale that left the nation speechless, people weren't exactly focused on the show that came next, and it just so happened that the pilot really demanded the focus of viewers. It's a non-linear and challenging show with a lot of what appear to be spiritual messages, delivered sometimes in confusing fashion. The title character, John Monad, is a mysterious stranger who suddenly appears in the orbit of the Yost family in Imperial Beach, California. They are royalty in the professional surfing world, but have suffered several setbacks, many of their own doing. They have a number of people around them who care for them, but are unable to help them pull out of their funk. Moreover, some of them are damaged people, and they too benefit from John's presence. John, who continually bemuses and confuses those around him, as he is often mistaken for being an autistic or special needs person, is able to help them even if they don't always realize that he is doing so. Again, it's not a show that flows in conventional ways or is always the easiest to follow in terms of how things are happening. Plus, the show clearly went over the heads of most critics, so its cancellation the day after the season one finale seemed almost automatic. Number four, John is a baffling character who seems highly susceptible to suggestion in terms of parroting back phrases that he hears, even days after the fact, which camouflages his underlying gifts and wisdom. Even the notion of him being from Cincinnati is doubtful, since it came when somebody made a guess and he just confirmed it. As the series goes along, it's implied that he may be a Christ-like figure with the gifts he possesses, the mystery that follows him, and his increasing references to his father. On a show with a number of people who frequently act like jerks, he's the one pure adult presence. Number three, young surfing prodigy Sean Yost is the other pure presence on the show, the recipient of otherworldly surfing genes who is cursed with unhappy circumstances that lend him a melancholy air. Pretty much every adult on the show is consumed with trying to look out for him, even as those closest to him are the most responsible for contributing to his premature world weariness. His father, Butchie Yost, is a second-generation surfing legend who revolutionized the sport with daring aerial maneuvers before succumbing to heroin addiction. His mother, Tina Blake, was also a drug addict who abandoned Sean for a career in porn. As such, Sean is raised by his grandparents, Mitch and Sissy. Mitch is the patriarch of the family surfing dynasty, but a leg injury left him embittered toward the business and prone to give in to self-indulgent hippie fantasies. He does begin to mysteriously levitate once John comes to town. Sissy is haunted by a terrible mistake that she made that helped destroy Butchie psychologically, and she is compensated by behaving like a difficult shrew in most social situations as a protective shield. Mitch and Sissy operate a surf shop with one other employee, Kai, an on-and-off-again girlfriend of Butchie, who is a top-flight surfer in her own right and is a friend and mentor of Sean's. Meyer Dickstein is the family lawyer who protects all of the hosts, but especially Butchie, for whom he arranges lodging at the Snug Harbor Motel, an abandoned facility administered by the kindly Ramon Gaviota. Barry Cunningham is a recent lottery winner who purchases the Snug Harbor Motel with the desire to tear it down, but his heart is softened toward the Yost family in part because of the ripple effects of John's presence. Bill Jax is a widowed and retired police officer who takes refuge in his grief over the loss of his wife by communicating incessantly with his pet birds and by placing himself at the beck and call of the Yost family who he reveres. Dr. Michael Smith is a neurologist who treats Sean after a serious accident and becomes completely drawn to the family after Sean is the recipient of an obvious miracle. 
Steady Freddy Lopez and Palaka are gangsters from Hawaii who supply drugs to Butchie, but in the midst of John's visit, they are drawn away from the criminal life and in service to the Yost family in ways that they cannot quite explain. The only figures who are drawn to the Yosts in a less than wholesome way are surf agent Link Stark and his business partner Jake Ferris, who exploited Butchie and wanted to do the same to Sean. Link even goes so far as to employ Cass, a winsome young filmmaker, to seduce Mitch in the hopes of busting up the Yost marriage and giving him complete entree to the young man. The web of figures who surround the Yosts is among the most interesting and eclectic in recent TV history. Number two, the cast is absolutely amazing. The lead roles are inhabited by such stars as Bruce Greenwood, Rebecca De Mornay, Brian Van Holt, Luke Perry, Austin Nichols, Ed O'Neill, Keela Kennelly, Grayson Fletcher, Willie Garson, Matt Winston, and Garrett Dillahunt. But wait, there's more. The remaining cast contains the likes of Luis Guzman, Jennifer Grey, Mark Paul Gosselar, Chandra West, Paul Ben Victor, Stephen Tobolowsky, Dayton Kelly, and Jim Beaver. That, ladies and gentlemen, is a murderer's row of a cast. Number one, this is the rare show where even if you find the plot and ongoing developments to be off-putting for whatever reason, the journey itself is a lot of fun. There's a lot of spare moments here and there, primarily with some of the background characters, which add a lot of levity and entertainment. Even if you're confused or underwhelmed by the macro level of what's going on, there's plenty of meaningful and or entertaining light moments at the micro level that are likely to make you miss this show once you've seen it all the way through, and that might very well make you want to watch it again. Thank you for joining us for this mini-episode of the FDH Lounge. As we bring the show to a close, we would like to extend our deepest gratitude to NBC, CBS, ABC, Fox, All Clear Channel Affiliates, TNT, TBS, USA, UPN, Deadspin.com, YouTube.com, YTMND.com, MySpace.com, various blogs, Fox News, CNN, CNBC, MSNBC, IamBoard.com, GoBoard.com, Google.com, ESPN, ESPN2, ESPN News, ESPN Classic, NBA TV, NFL Network, Sports Time Ohio, Athlon Magazine, Comedy Central, Cartoon Network, The Boomerang Channel, QVC, BET, The Spice Channel, Steno Notebooks, Manwich, Papermate Office Supplies, Waitresses, Strippers, Bartenders, Garbage Men, Janitors, Microwave Popcorn, The Writers of The Office, Scrubs, Entourage, My Name is Earl, Oz, Metalocalypse and the Boondocks, Aquafina, and The Periodic Table of Elements. 